This is Edward October, host of October Pod on YouTube. Hear that jingle jingle? It could be Kris Kringle, or a home invader looking for an open window, a jilted lover looking for revenge, or a disgruntled co-worker hoping to spike your eggnog with arsenic. The girls of our true crime podcast are always on Santa's nice list, but the crimes they discuss are very naughty indeed. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, Jen. Hey, Cam. Welcome to day four. Day four. Four, four, four. And we are back in Michigan. We were going back. So going we back liked to it there. We, we did. liked it there. We went back. Can't wait. You ready, ready to go? Uh, all right, all. let's go. Let's right, go. Ready? Let's go. Yep. All right. On a cold and cloudy May of 1992, a middle-aged man and his mother visited the Hillview Memorial Cemetery in the Springfield Township of Oakland County, Michigan. They were there to leave flowers for his father, who had passed away two years before. The man noticed something odd as he approached his father's grave. There was a car parked haphazardly on the drive, with the door standing wide open. The man honked his horn, but when he got no response, he became worried. So he got out of the car to investigate, and there he saw a tattooed, muscular man with a mustache dragging a woman into the bushes along the tree line. Ooh. The mustached man had his hand over the woman's mouth, and she looked very frightened. And the guy said, Sir, will you go away? The muscular tattooed man yelled, and then simulated having sex with the woman. Ugh. The older man's blood ran cold as he realized that what was going on wasn't exactly consensual. Yeah. So as casually as he could... He placed the flowers on his father's grave, turned, and took down the car's license plate number, and then drove away. He and his mother planned on going to the closest store to call the police, but as luck would have it, he happened upon a patrol officer who was at the scene of the accident, just a quarter of a mile from the entrance to the cemetery. He told the officer he'd just seen a man try to abduct a woman from Hillview Memorial. Oakland County Deputy Gary Alexander hopped into his car and headed straight for the graveyard. As the officer got closer, he saw the car speeding down the road and then engaged in a high-speed chase. As the car swerved and sped faster, so did Deputy Alexander, pursuing the car for just about two miles. Finally, the suspect lost control of the car and crashed into a post. The officer jumped out of his vehicle, hauled the suspect from behind the wheel, and threw him to the ground. And as he was cuffing the man, he heard a sound. The officer stopped, glanced around, and realized the noise was coming from the car's trunk. Oh. After securing the suspect, the officer managed to open the trunk, and there he found a woman bound with his plastic zip tie around her neck. In an obvious panic, the woman tried to get out of the trunk as Deputy Alexander attempted to cut the tie that constricted her throat. After struggling for a few moments, he managed to free her. Alexander also found a handgun, a knife, and a bag of zip ties in the car. The deputy pulled the driver's license from the man's wallet, which read, Leslie Allen Williams. While Deputy Alexander may have never heard of Leslie Allen Williams, the man he now had in handcuffs was very well known to Michigan courts, jails, and parole officers. The arrest of Leslie Allen Williams would shine a light on the weakness of the criminal justice system, expose how insufficient mental health care and child care can have deadly consequences, and ultimately, his arrest would lead to the locations of four dead teenage girls. The arrest on that day, in May of 1992, cut short of the career of a serial killer who was just amping up, but it's also left everybody wondering why he was even put out on the streets in the first place. Leslie Allen Williams was born on Independence Day in 1953 in Detroit, Michigan. We've seen Indiana mentioned, but we're going to go with Detroit, Michigan, because that's mostly where it's from or what we found. And for those not in the U.S. that don't know, 
Independence Day is July 4th. Known as less to most people, his earliest years were spent in the Garden City suburb of Detroit with several siblings. His parents were Lyle and Dorothy Williams. Dorothy had two daughters from a previous marriage and then three boys with Lyle. It wasn't long until Dorothy realized that Lyle couldn't earn enough money for their ever-growing family, so Dorothy became a sex worker to help bring in much-needed cash. Lyle encouraged her choice of employment because he was a voyeur and liked to hide in the closet and watch his wife have sex with her clients. Leslie Allen Williams, or Les, had been a cute kid with long golden ringlets and beautiful eyes. And when he was about four, I mean, he was a good kid, right? He took the blame for something his sister had done when he Mm -hmm. was four. And Lyle was a ruthless and brutal father. He beat him relentlessly with a strap and a wooden board. Lyle burned gifts given to Les's sisters by their grandparents because Lyle didn't want the grandparents to have anything to do with the children. When Les's sister was five years old, Lyle shaved her head for accidentally leaving a small notch on his workbench. He used to drag Les through the house by the hair on his head, and the children were horrified to breathe for fear of Lyle's wrath. Aside from the beatings and psychological torture, Lyle also sexually molested his two stepdaughters and two of the neighborhood boys. The girls tried to run away, fleeing to their grandparents' house, but they didn't tell their grandparents about the sexual abuse for fear that Lyle would do it to them again. And so the grandparents returned them to their home. In 1957, when Les was four years old, the police raided the Garden City home. Acting on information from the parent of one of the neighborhood boys that Lyle had molested, and on tips from other neighbors that Dorothy was engaging in sex work in their home, the police arrested both Dorothy and Lyle. Dorothy was arrested for prostitution, and Lyle was arrested for taking indecent liberties with his stepdaughters. And although at first he denied any misconduct with his stepdaughters, despite neighborhood children who witnessed some of those acts, he did eventually plead guilty. He was sent to the mental hospital for the criminally insane in Ionia. Leslie Allen Williams watched as his parents were taken away in handcuffs, and then Leslie and his siblings were taken to a detention home in Detroit where the five of them slept huddled together in three beds. His oldest sister was about nine years old at the time, and she did her best to hold and comfort the youngest of her siblings, who was just 18 months old. Leslie and his older brother eventually went to live with his grandparents. The extent of counseling or therapy Les received as a child is unknown, but when he was six, he was given a psychological test. And on those fill-in-the-blank questionnaires, one question read, Boys grow up to be men. Girls grow up to be (gasps) blank. Uh Uh-oh. And at the ripe old age of six years old, Leslie Williams answered, punished. Oh, that's sad. When Leslie's mother, Dorothy, exited prison in 1959, the children were returned to her. She divorced Lyle Williams in 1961 and remarried a man named James Adams in 1962. The couple lived in Southern California with Les and one of his brothers, while her two daughters and youngest son went to live elsewhere. The five children would never live together as a family again. Adams also beat Leslie, and when his mother Dorothy would come to his aid, Adams would then beat her too for helping him. The marriage fell apart, and when Dorothy filed for divorce, Adams was enraged and distraught. And on the day before the hearing, Adams simply walked up to Dorothy, shot her in the head, <gasps> and then turned the gun on himself. What? Leslie Williams, now about nine years old, was returned to Michigan to live with his grandparents and older brother. He lived with the guilt that he had somehow caused his mother's death. His criminal career started in 1970 at the age of 17. He was arrested and served one year's probation. Some accounts say one year in jail. And it was for breaking and entering in Milford, Michigan. 
1975, he raped a woman in West Bloomfield Township, Michigan. He was sentenced to 14 to 25 years, but he served just seven years and was paroled. Two weeks after being paroled in September of 1983, he was arrested for sexual assault on a woman in her home. He pled guilty to assault with intent to commit kidnapping and assault with intent to sexually penetrate. This time, Williams was also charged with being a habitual offender, which carries the possibility of life in prison. Somehow, he evaded the life in prison sentence and was given 5 to 10 years for the assault and 7 to 30 years for the repeat offender charge. He only served eight years before once again being paroled on the recommendation of his therapist. It's unreal. While in prison, Leslie was considered a model prisoner by Hmm. whatever standards it is to make one a model prisoner. He finished his GED and began working on an associate's degree in college. He worked a job within the prison system for five years, and he also underwent 14 months of therapy. When he was released in 1990, he lived with his uncle. Williams reported to parole officers in the Corrections Department office on Detroit's west side. William Mannix, his parole supervisor, said Williams had been a perfect parolee, reporting twice a month as required and presenting check stubs to show that he was working. Quote, he was a low-key, mild-mannered person, Mannix said. We never saw any evidence of any kind of problems as if the parolees would advertise, right? That they were going to go out and commit sexual attacks in between visits, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In November of 1990, Leslie attempted to abduct a woman at Knife Point at a new Hudson, Michigan gas station. Witnesses at the scene managed to take down his license plate number. The woman refused to press charges, so Williams again stayed out of jail. However, even if the woman refused to press charges, other people still witnessed the event And they could attest that, you know, maybe Witness wasn't the perfect parolee, right? Mm -hmm. But nothing was done. In March of 1991, Williams shoplifted a cassette player and two cassette tapes worth about $55. He was arrested, fined just $75, and released. This should have been a violation of his parole, too, but somehow it was overlooked or missed or turned a blind eye to who knows something on august 11th 1991 leslie raped a nine-year-old girl september 14th 1991 les williams followed 18 year old cammy villanueva home from south lyon michigan cammy who was a senior in high school had gone to the store and there she talked with some friends for a while and then walked back to her home at around 10 p.m Williams peeked through Cammie's bedroom window and saw her playing cards on her bed. He tried the door, found it unlocked, and simply walked in. He moved so quietly and quickly that he managed to grab her in total surprise. Cammie hadn't even realized anybody was in her home until she was dragged down the hallway. Once Williams had her in his car, he drove her to a secluded place where he raped and killed her and buried her body in a shallow grave. Two weeks later, on September 29, 1991, Les Williams saw the Urban sisters out for their evening walk. Michelle Urban, age 16, and Melissa Urban, aged 14, were not just sisters, they were the best of friends. Even though they had had separate bedrooms, one would often end up sleeping in the other one's room. The girls also had a brother who was 18 at the time and a little sister who was 12. The 29th was a Sunday and the family had just finished their Sunday meal. So the two girls did the dishes and then asked if they could go for a walk. Perhaps because their mother had awakened that morning with an uneasy feeling that something terrible was going to happen, she asked the girls what route they would take for their walk. The girls told their parents and then they went out the back door with a promise to return at the designated time only they didn't return. Since the two sisters had run away before, their parents thought maybe something similar had occurred, although Mrs. Urban felt deep in her bones that this time it was different. A horrible feeling came over her again, so Mr. and Mrs. Urban spent several hours driving around trying to find their daughters. When Michelle and Melissa didn't return the following morning, they called the police to report them missing. The Urbans would never see Michelle and Melissa again because Leslie Allen Williams had targeted the girls as his next victims. 
He had seen them walking on eight occasions and knew the routes they liked to take. That night, he abducted both girls, raped them, murdered them by strangulation, and then put them in the trunk of his car. He drove the bodies to a secluded spot where he raped the bodies again. Then he buried them in a shallow grave. In the meantime, Alana Heft had recently moved to Milford, Michigan, because it was, quote, a good place to raise your kids. And by all accounts, that was and is a true statement. The crime rate's very low. Located just 20 minutes south of where the Urbans lived, the town of Milford often has parades and public events, and it's very supportive of the kids in the community. Alana was a recent divorcee with four children, and she worked as much as 80 hours a week to give her children a good life. Alana's oldest daughter, Cynthia Jones, was a responsible 15-year-old who instinctively knew how and when to help her mother with the younger kids. Cindy was in the marching band and loved gymnastics, and she had just started dating 16-year-old Lucas, a football player. And on the night of January 4th, 1992, the two grabbed a soda and drove to nearby Central Park. While the two were talking in the car, Les Williams approached them and said he'd just robbed a store and he needed their car as a getaway. So Lucas and Cindy got out of the car, and Williams proceeded to tie Lucas up with zip ties, and then he dragged Cindy into the woods where he raped and murdered her. In a flood of adrenaline, Lucas managed to break one of the plastic ties. He called Cindy's name, but she didn't answer. So he ran to a local restaurant and called 911. Police arrived and, at first, found the whole thing suspicious. There hadn't been any robberies in Milford that night, and they found it questionable that Lucas could break a zip tie. Lucas took them back to where the abduction occurred, and the police found two sets of prints leading away from the crime scene. The smaller prints were most likely Cindy's. The larger prints didn't match Lucas's. That, combined with the lie detector test that he passed, convinced the police that Lucas was telling the truth. Authorities now found themselves scratching their heads. Four girls in two counties within four months were now missing. Aerial searches were done, and public pleas for information were made but it was as if all four girls had just vanished off the face of the earth. The media began wondering if the four cases were connected. Since the disappearances had happened in two counties, authorities from each county came together and prepared notes. It was felt that there wasn't enough similarities in the disappearances in the case to determine that the same person committed them, so the investigators all returned to their prospective precincts and continued to work the cases separately. That is until May of 1992, when a good citizen reported that an abduction had occurred in the Hillview Memorial Cemetery. Within minutes of Leslie Allen Williams' photograph being plastered on the 11 o'clock news, the phones in the police department began to ring. Even as Williams was not saying a word or admitting to anything except the attempted kidnapping from the cemetery, investigators were learning quite a bit about him. A former girlfriend of Leslie's called to say that she believed with all her heart that Leslie could murder. She shared a story with them of how, when she was dating him, that she had bought a little kitten. One day, she came home from work to find the kitten gone. At first, Les wouldn't tell her where it was, but after she pressed him, he said, quote, I killed the cat, and then he took her to where he'd buried it. The ex-girlfriend offered to take the police to where Les had buried the kitten. About four miles south of Milford, Michigan, Les's ex-girlfriend showed the investigators the burial spot. A little way from where the kitten had been buried, police found a patch of disturbed earth. They began digging, and about two feet down, they came upon clothing and realized a body was buried there. The remains were that of 18-year-old Cami Villanueva. While the area was being searched, other investigators searched the home of Les Williams. They found a ring that had belonged to Cami. If the authorities thought that they would be in for a long night of questioning and brutal interrogation, they were wrong. When Les realized that they'd found Cammy and one of her rings that had been found in his apartment, he stared straight ahead and said, quote, I took them all. Leslie Allen Williams confessed to kidnapping and killing Cammy Villanueva, Michelle and Melissa Urban, and Cindy Jones. One mile west of where Cammy's body was found, were the remains of Cindy Jones. Williams then led them to a burial place of the Urban Sisters. All four victims were retrieved and released to their loved ones. The funerals were held on June 1, 1992, in their respective hometowns. 
Leslie Allen Williams admitted he needed to be locked up with the key thrown away. He pleaded guilty to every charge and also to the rape of the nine-year-old girl. He told the police about every rape, attack, and kidnapping he could remember. He refused bail, saying that he wouldn't allow anybody to post it if he was given one. He also didn't want to make the family suffer anymore by having a trial. He quite simply just wanted to be put away and left alone. A few years later, Les Williams was a guest on where? The Oprah Winfrey Show. Nuh-uh. Yes. Really? Via satellite from prison. And he stated <gasps> that he knew if he were ever to let out on jail that he would rape and kill again. And he admitted that he was a broken human being who was not in control of his life or his compulsions. Huh. And since his first arrest in 1970, whether the system knew it or not, Leslie Allen Williams had never gone more than four months without violating his probation. There were four dead teenagers and an outraged public, media, and even some law enforcement who blamed the system that paroled Les Williams not once, but twice, even after he had been convicted of being a repeat offender. In 1990, a parole board in Michigan considered 11,000 cases and paroled 8,888 offenders. Of those 8,888 offenders, statistics show that 20% ended up in prison for new violations, and 20% ended up back in jail for violating their parole agreements. That means almost half, approximately 5,300 parolees, ended up back in the system. And how many of those 5,300 individuals committed crimes that hurt innocent people while they were out in the streets? Many critics of the system claim it's only interested in emptying prison beds rather than keeping the public safe. The parole board is obviously not solely responsible for the death of the four girls. Les Williams, the one who murdered them, is. But everything from the judges assigning a light sentence to Les being paroled to improper care as a child or not enough serious counseling as a child all played a part. Today, Leslie Allen Williams is incarcerated in Carson City with no chance of parole, and that is precisely the way he and the public want it. So in the words of William McDonald, one of Les Williams' therapists, quote, The whole field of psychopathology is just basically a dance with the demons. A dance in which Les Williams could not maintain the lead, and many innocent families paid the ultimate price. And there you have it, day four. You know, I do find it unusual that Les is able to see himself for what he mm-hmm. is and know that he cannot be released. He a can't lot of, help himself. And yeah, a lot, yeah, a lot of people don't own up to that. So mm-hmm. that's interesting. And if that had taken place or doctors would have intervened earlier, then he would have never been released in the first place. To de- He should never. I mean, he broke Pearl so many times that it's unreal. Wow. So, but it's yeah, interesting. Horrible. You can find uh, Les's Oprah interview, Oprah interview on YouTube. And uh, I think yeah. I kind of remember that mm-hmm. because she did, she would have people on at, the name kind of sounded familiar to me as you were talking which, of course, I thought, did we already cover this well, person? it's kind because... of like a, a generic name, too, right? No, I know, but Leslie for a male killer, we haven't, yeah. there's not, we haven't covered a lot of those, I don't think. I don't know. I'm going to go watch that because I want to see if there's, um, if that's the one, if that's the episode I'm thinking of. Yeah, well, it, it's weird because she's got a giant television right next stage to with her. four women, right? And it's mm-hmm. just like his big fat head on the screen. Like, it's not, it's, it was weird. Hmm. Interesting. I don't know. I don't know. Huh. He's creepy. Glad he's he caught and put away forever. See you. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm. Throw away that key. Yep. Speaking of throwing away that key, have you got all your shopping done yet? Uh, no, I have not. Are you shocked? Okay. No, yeah. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm still but... waiting for the girls to uh, tell us what they want. So, yeah. well, they're at that age. I know. You know, just throw cash at them and say, yeah, Merry Christmas. Exactly. Yeah. Or Santa can throw cash at them. Yep. Yeah, when we were teenagers, remember, you would get all that cash, and then we'd drive on down to St. Louis and go to the mall. Oh, yeah. Buy stuff. As soon as the mall's open that next day, we were there. Got to spend it all. Can't keep it. 
Those days are gone. It does. It does kind of make me sad that these kids aren't growing up in malls like we did because that was kind of the thing. Oh, my girls love the mall. Are you kidding me? Really? They love it. Mm -mm. They didn't. I have one that loves thrift stores, and then I have one that loves the mall. So yeah, my daughter's the thrifter. I I don't think she's ever. I swear to you when I say I don't think she's ever bought an article of clothing over twenty dollars. That's awesome. She only shops at Goodwill and the thrift stores. Mm -hmm. No, I've got one that loves thrift and they got one that loves the brand names so <laughs> you do kind mm-hmm. of balances it out on yep. the christmas right and you spend 25 dollars on one and 2500 on the other and we even tried to do the thing where it's like give you each a set amount of money and you can spend it anywhere and the one would take it to the thrift store and get a ton of clothes and the other one would like go to the mall and get like a pair of underwear <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. cuz it's just one lipstick exactly but mom it's dior exactly exactly yeah but Not whatever. Me. I was always about getting more for your money, you mm. know. I like Shop those room. after Christmas sales. Woo! Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like to sale, that's for sure. Me too, me too. But anyway, hope we're keeping you company and I hope everything's going well for everybody. Day four. We're getting close to being halfway there. I know. Woo! That All was right. quick. We're All right, Jen, there. until uh until tomorrow, day five. And it's my turn. It is. Uh we will see you right back here tomorrow. But until then, remember, lock your doors. Keep passing by those open windows. Uh, Bye-bye. Love ya. For more information about this episode, as well as all other sources, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at OurTrueCrimePodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by the hosts, Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Fertese from We Talk of Dreams. You can reach Nico at wetalkofdreams.com. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from Octoberpod VHS. You can find all of his great works on YouTube. Please make sure to like and subscribe to our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at Our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter with the handle at Our True Crime Pod. You can also email us at Our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. We would also at this time like to thank our patrons. We would be so lost without you. Thank you so much. And if you would like to help support the show, you can check us out on patreon.com slash Our True Crime Podcast. You can also show your support by leaving a five-star review on Apple or simply just tell your friends about us. It's that easy. Love ya.